This is part of a broader push that China has been making, at least for the last decade. Uh, some argue for longer, but it's intensified in the in the post-COVID era, where China is essentially trying to embed itself as a serious Pacific security and policing player or partner. Now, the most obvious, vivid and controversial uh, manifestation of that is in Solomon Islands, of course, where China has signed a formal security agreement with Solomon Islands. You've now got uh, around 20 or so Chinese police officers effectively permanently embedded in, in Solomon Islands and so-called uh, the CL, uh, CPLTs or China Police Liaison Teams. So they're essentially in, engaged in a rolling routine of training uh, troops and uh, training police across Solomon Islands uh, and uh, and advising, as well as, of course, handing over equipment and the like fairly regularly. What we've seen over the last year or so in particular um, is a real attempt by China to broaden out its footprint. Now, we've seen that in places like Kiribati, where we now know there are Chinese police embedded in the, in the local police force as advisors. Uh, we've seen that to an extent in Vanuatu. Uh, we're seeing uh, the opposite in Fiji, where police have actually been based for quite some time, but where Sitveni Rambuka, the Prime Minister, actually uh, effectively kicked them out last year, saying that he didn't want them to be a permanent part of the uh, the police force. And now we're seeing a push in other countries, including uh, Tonga. Now, in Tonga, what we've essentially seen this week is a visiting delegation from China of six officers from the MPS, or the Ministry of Public Security, They've offered not only to hand over police motorcycles and vehicles to the government of Tonga to help them run the Pacific Islands Forum leaders meeting later this year in August, uh, but also there's been some sort of offer that's been put on the table for training as well, whether that's just training for the uh, Pacific Islands Forum uh, leaders meeting in things like motorcades and the like, or whether it's more extensive uh, training is not yet clear. But Australia, at the very least, sees this as a continuation of this broader push from China to cement itself as a, as a security player in the region. So how concerned is Australia and, you know, is there anything they can do to, to try and counter it or at least match what uh, China is doing? Well, the typical strategy that Australia has taken here is to occupy the space. So what we've seen in a number of countries is Australia has essentially gone to these nations and said, look, tell us what you need, tell us what equipment you need, tell us what training you need. We will provide it in concert with other Pacific Island nations, including New Zealand and, and others. That's been the tactic so far. I mean, Solomon Islands, and it's a bit belated, of course, because Solomon Islands has now got China well and truly ensconced. But in Solomon Islands, you now see, for example, Australia making it very clear to Manasseh Sokovari, the prime minister, that should he want to go even further and set up an army, something that he said he'd like to do, then Australia will essentially be on hand to provide whatever assistance is necessary. Now, the reasoning there is basically we need to make sure that we are in the room and not only in the room, but the central player, uh, because if we don't, then there's a risk that China will insert itself. Uh, now, what we're going to see, I suspect, in in Tonga is something similar. Australia coming, if it hasn't already, making very clear offers that we are willing to make any sort of commitment necessary to uh, to ensure that we remain the main security partner. Whether that's sufficient, of course, is a separate question, because even though it's typically cast in terms of China filling gaps that Australia and New Zealand, you know, uh, cannot uh, themselves fill, I mean, the reality is it's much more complicated than that. China is making a play in this space, and it's not only making a play in this space, it's also willing to throw quite a bit of political capital behind it. So Samoa and Tonga and countries like that might feel obliged or might even feel enthusiastic about uh, allowing the Chinese in as trainers or as partners in the policing space, at least in part because they're keen to keep Beijing on board more broadly, uh, because they're keen, for example, to ensure that China continues to invest in infrastructure in their country uh, or that China will continue to be a, a, major, uh, a major player in other areas. So Although it's often talked about in terms of gaps, it's not simply, it's not as straightforward as that. Australia can't solve this problem simply by showing up and offering vast amounts of cash, resources, training, equipment, material, whatever. It's a political contest as well. And because China is putting so much weight behind this, 
Pacific Island leaders, in some cases, are feeling the pressure. In others, of course, they're quite easy about China coming in, even enthusiastic. Stephen, do you think it's becoming a bit of a case of uh, the Pacific nations playing off one against the other? Yeah, there's no doubt that Pacific Island elites are very, very aware of this dynamic and are very willing to play Australia and China off against one another. Now, they may do that gleefully in some instances. Some people say that Manasseh Sogavari enjoys playing Australia off China. Others may do much more grudgingly. They may, in some cases, really resent the fact that they've got, you know, these very sharp-elbowed major or larger powers trying to cajole them or coerce them. Uh, but they're also cognizant that it does offer opportunities as well as risks. And some Pacific Island nations are very happy to try and play both across, uh, play both sides against one another because it allows them to maximise uh, the, uh, the offers that both sides are, are willing to give. Of course, in some instances, that also does really come with risk. So one of the main warnings that we've seen with Solomon Islands uh, is that Manasseh Sogavari is supremely confident about his capacity to play China and Australia against one another, when in reality, uh, he may well be committing Solomon Islands to things that down the track present really wicked problems, uh, whether that's a permanent or a semi-permanent Chinese police presence, a Chinese security presence, or various iterations around that. So it's an interesting game, and it can occasionally be a fraught one. It's one that most Pacific, game, Pacific Island leaders are very adept at playing, but it's a fraught one. Yeah, risky. Good to talk as always, Stephen. Thanks. Thanks, Beverly. I appreciate it.